हमारी शास्त्र क्या कहते हैं और ने क्या लिखा है इस बारे में तो प्लीज वेलकम है ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाया सो आई एम गोइंग टू रीड टू यू एक्सर्प्स from Srila Prabhupada's books, mostly from Srimad Bhagavatam, on this topic of Srad. Of course, I can only present to you what Srila Prabhupada has written because that is my duty as his disciple. So, first excerpt is from the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, of course, what you are doing is the first item of devotional service, Shravanam, hearing. So it requires some patience, it requires some tolerance, but as Prabhupada used to say, just try to hear. Just as Krishna told Arduna, touch Srinu. You may not understand, that's all right, just try to hear. You'll at least pick up one, two, maybe more. But just by hearing, you are going to become purified. Desiring to get a perfect son and become an inhabitant of Pitri Loka, Maharaj Agnidra once worshipped Lord Brahma, the master of those in charge of material creation. He went to a valley of Mandara Hill where the damsels of the heavenly planets come down to stroll. There he collected garden flowers and other necessary paraphernalia and then engaged in severe austerities and worship. So now Prabhupada explains nicely. The king became Pitri Loka Kam or desirous of being transferred to the planet named Pitri Loka. Pitri Loka is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Yanti Deva Vrta Devan Patrin Yanti Patri Vrta To go to this planet, one needs very good sons who can make offerings to Lord Vishnu and then offer the remnants to their forefathers. The purpose of the Sraddha ceremony is to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu. So that after pleasing Krishna, one may offer prasad to one's forefathers and in this way make them happy. So there's your first lesson. Prabhupada now has given you the basis of what is the srad ceremony. To please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So if you can't remember anything, just remember that. That's good enough. The inhabitants of Pitri Loka are generally men of the Karma Kandiya or fruitive activities category who have been transferred there because of their pious activities. They can stay there as long as their descendants offer them Vishnu Prasad. Everyone in the heavenly planets such as Pitriloka, however, must return to earth after exhausting the effects of his or her pious acts. As confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, Shine Punye Marchalokam Vishanti. Persons who perform pious acts are transferred to higher planets, <coughs> but when the effects of their pious acts are over, they are again transferred to earth. So this is one of the things that you can say is the downside of being karmakanda. Yes, you can go to the heavenly planets, but not forever. 
Just like you can go on vacation, but not forever. Eventually, you have to come back. So even Indra, Cha, all the demigods, they're only demigods for one Manvantara. I mean, uh, one Yuga, whatever it is, for some time. I think it's 71 Yuga cycles. But after that, back. Just like we studied the Vamana Leela. In the next Manvantara, Indra is now whoever is Bali. Bali becomes, and the one who's Indra now, bye bye, back to earth. This is the fault of performing pious activities and going to the heavenly planets. Whereas if you go back home, back to Godhead, that's permanent. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you don't come back unless you force Krishna's hand and you insist, no, Krishna, I want to come back to earth. But normally, having once gone back, you don't come back here. Whereas in the heavenly planets, you don't have a choice. When your pious credits are up, bye-bye. As Krishna says in the 11th canto, there's this famous verse where Krishna is speaking to Uddhava. So you're living in the heavenly planets. You have your own airplane. And on your airplane, there are goddesses who are chanting, Jaya Kundan, Jaya Kakani. They, these beautiful damsels are chanting your glories on your own airplane. Okay? But then what does Krishna say? When your pious credits come up, you fall head first from your airplane down to earth. So, make your choice. You want to go to the heavenly planets or do you want to go back home to Krishna? All in favor of going back to Krishna say, Hare Bull. Okay, Prabhupada continues. Maharaj Agnidra desired to be transferred to Pitriloka and therefore he needed a wife because anyone desiring to be transferred to Pitriloka must leave behind a good son to offer yearly pinda or prashad from Lord Vishnu. To have a good son, Maharaj Agnidra wanted a wife from a family of demigods. Therefore he went to Mandara Hill where the women of the demigods generally come to worship Lord Brahma. So that's the first. I have a few excerpts. This next one is from after Hiranyakashipu is killed by Lord Nasringa. So you know the story. After Lord Nasringa killed Hiranyakashipu, Lord Nasringa was still angry. He was roaring. So all the devatas, Brahma, Shiva, Indra, all of them offered prayers to stop Lord Nasringa from being angry. So a representative of this Pitriloka planet, he also came to offer prayers to Lord Nasringa. So here is his verse. Sri Pitra Uchu. So it's a whole bunch of them because it's plural. Sri Pitra Uchu. Sadadani ni dibubje prasabanga tanu jair. Dadani tir samaye piabipat tailambu. Tas yodarana kavadir navapad ya archchat. Tas my namon rihare kila dharma goptre. So here, Lord Nisringa is referred to as Nrihari. Everybody say. It's another way of saying Lord Nisringa. Nrihari. And in the verse, there is this word, Sradadhani. And Prabhupada defines it. Performances of the Sraddha ceremony. Offering of food grains to the dead fathers by a particular process. 
So as we learned in the previous, those food grains have to be Vishnu Prasad, has to be offered. Here's the translation. The inhabitants of Pitriloka prayed, Let us offer our respectful obeisances unto Lord Nasringadev, the maintainer of religious principles of the universe. He has killed Hiranyakashipu, the demon who by force enjoyed all the offerings of the Sraddha ceremonies performed by our sons and grandsons on the anniversaries of our death and who drank the water with sesame seeds offered in holy places of pilgrimage. So just see, they were starving and Hiranyakashipu was enjoying everything. So this is one reason why everybody wanted Hiranyakashipu to die. They wanted the Lord to kill him because he was stealing everything. Everything was being offered to him. Hiranyakashipu made himself the supreme controller. Everybody had to worship him. So they made it very clear. He, by force, he was enjoying all the offerings that were supposed to go to them. By killing this demon, O Lord, you have taken back all this stolen property from his abdomen by piercing it with your nails. As the picture shows, he's right there. There's the nails, there's the intestines. We therefore wish to offer you our respectful obeisances. Purport. Again, Prabhupada, now this is for all of us, pay attention. It is the duty of all householders to offer food grains to all their departed forefathers. But during the time of Ranyikashipu, this process was stopped. No one would offer Shraddha oblations of food grains to the forefathers with great respect. Thus, when there is a demoniac rule, Everything concerning the Vedic principles is turned upside down. All the religious ceremonies of yajna are stopped. The resources meant to be spent for yajna are taken away by the demoniac government. Everything becomes chaotic and consequently the entire world becomes hell itself. When the demons are killed by the presence of Nisringadev, Everyone feels comfortable, irrespective of the planet upon which he or she lives. So this same thing, you notice, when Kamsa was ruling, after the ape child of Devaki, Kamsa did the same thing. He stopped all kinds of Vedic performances. The Brahmins were afraid to do anything. So this, that's what demons do. They try to stop religious activities. Let's go to the next. Now the next excerpt is by Lord Nisringa himself. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Kudutang Pretakrityani Pitu Putasya Sarvasha Mad Angas Parshanang Yati Supraja. So, this of course is after Lord Nasringa has killed Hiranyakashipu, and none of the demigods were able to pacify Lord Nasringa. Who was able to pacify him? Prahlad. He was the only one. Lord Brahma tried to get Lakshmi. She said, no, I've never seen him like this so angry. I'm not going. So, only Prahlad was able to stop Lord Nasringa's roaring. And he offered more than 40 beautiful prayers to the Lord. So after, Lord, um, I mean, after Prahlad offered prayers... Nasringa Dev finally spoke. Here's one of the things. My dear child, Prahlad. So what kind of Nasringa? Now he's Shanta Nasringa. 
my dear child Pallad. Your father has already been purified just by the touch of my body at the time of his death. So that's the touch. <laughs> Is that the kind of touch you want? You want that touch? <laughs> but you don't want that scene, do you? No. Of course, we'll take it if that's all we get. But we don't desire that touch. Nonetheless, now this, okay, so this is, is Lord Nisring a God? Yes or no? Lord Nisring is the same as Krishna, yes? Okay, he's Bhagavan, right? So this is what Bhagavan is saying. So he's saying, your father has already been purified. Nonetheless, the duty of a son is to perform the Shraddha ritualistic ceremony after his father's death so that his father may be promoted to a planetary system where he may become a good citizen and a devotee. So it's the duty of the son. Purport. Balad Maharaj was advised to perform the ritualistic ceremony as a matter of etiquette for the Supreme Personality of Godhead under no circumstances wants to stop the regulative principles. The Acharya Madhvamuni also instructs that when the demons Madhu and Kaitava were killed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and that particular incarnation was Hayagriva, the horse-headed incarnation, their kinsmen also observed the ritualistic ceremonies so that these demons could return home back to Godhead. Same with Ravan. When Ravan was killed by Lord Ram, who did the Shraddha? Wasn't it Vibhishan? It was Vibhishan, his brother. Because all of his sons had been killed. There were no sons. Ram killed all of them, one after the other. If you know the story, um, Ravan sent one son, Ram and Lakshman killed the next son, Ram and Lakshman killed, until finally, who was the last son to be killed? Indra, Indrajit. Indrajit was the last one. After that, no more sons. So his brother had to do it. So that, and that shows that Ram was kind. He didn't, he, he blessed Ravana by doing that. That was like a benediction. Okay, the next set of instructions is from Narada Muni to Yudhisthir. So, the whole seventh canto is a conversation between Narada and Yudhisthir at the time of the Rajasuya sacrifice. It was at that sacrifice that Krishna killed what, what demon? Shishupal. And after Krishna cut off the head of Shishupal, Sri Radha Ramanaki. So after Shishupal was killed and Shishupal's soul entered the body of Krishna, Yudhishthir asked Narada, Can you please explain what was this all about? So then Narada began to explain the three lifetimes of Shishupal. First he was Hiranyakashipu, then he was Ravana, and then his final demon birth was Shishupal. So Narada explained everything about Hiranyakashipu, and then after that, there was a discussion between Narada and Yudhishthir about Varnashram Dharma. So this statement by Narada appears in that section when they're discussing different aspects of Varna and Ashram. Narada said, O King Yudhisthir, at the time prescribed for reformatory religiousistic ceremonies for oneself, one's wife, or one's children, or doing, during funeral ceremonies and annual death ceremonies, one must perform auspicious ceremonies in order to flourish in fruitive activities. Now, in this section, I didn't include it in today's reading, 
But in this section, there's a whole list of what are the most auspicious times to do srad. So if you're interested, I'll show you where in the Bhagavatam those particular days are. Prabhupada's purport. The word ayana means path or going. The six months when the sun moves toward the north are called Uttarayana, or the northern path. And the six months when it moves south is called Dakshinayana, or the southern path. These are mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. The first day when the sun begins to move north and enter the zodiacal sign of Capricorn is called Makara Sankranti. And the first day when the sun begins to move south and enter the sign of cancer, it is called Karkata Sankranti. On these two days of the year, one should perform the Shraddha ceremony. The Shuva or Vishuva Sankranti means Mesha Sankranti or the day on which the sun enters the sign Aries. Tula Sankranti is the day on which the sun enters the sign Libra. Both of these days occur, occur only once within a year. The word yoga refers to a certain relationship between the sun and moon as they move in the sky. There are 27 degrees of yoga, of which the 17th is called Vyatipat. On the day when this occurs, one should perform the Shraddha ceremony. A titi or lunar day consists of the distance between the longitude of the sun and that of the moon. Sometimes a titi is less than 24 hours. When it starts after sunrise and a certain day and ends before the sunrise of the following day, the previous titi and the following titi both touch the 24-hour day between sunrises. This is called Trayahasparsha, or a day touched by some portion of three titis. Srila Jiva Goswami has given quotations from many shastras stating that the Shraddha ceremony or oblations to the forefathers should not be performed on Akadasi. So don't ever do Srad on Akadasi. And if you don't know what is a codice, ask one of the pundits. Or you can text me. Don't do srat. And here's why. Check this out. When the titi of the death anniversary falls on the codice day, the shraddha ceremony should be held not on the codice, but on the next day, dwadashi. In the Brahma Vaivarta Purana, it is said that if one performs the Shraddha ceremony of oblations to the forefathers on the Ekadasi Titi, so if you do it on Ekadasi, the performer, the forefathers for whom the Shraddha is observed, the Purohit, or the family priest who encourages it, all go to hell. Who wants to go to hell? Good. So, Akadasi is just for chanting, Namahat, and hearing and chanting. Not for Srad. Just see, Akadasi is so powerful. The Vedas recommend many ritualistic ceremonies to be performed with one's wife on the birthdays of one's children or during funeral ceremonies. And there are also personal reformatory methods like initiation. These must be observed according to time and circumstances and the directions of the Shastras. Bhagavad Gita strongly recommends Gyatva Shastra Vidhanoktam. Everything must be performed as indicated in the Shastras. That's in the end of chapter 16. Krishna points out. Krishna, in chapter 16, Krishna says there are three gates leading to hell. What are they? 
Lust, anger, greed. And then he says if you want to avoid these, then you have to follow the scriptures. Now, Kakani, of all the scriptures, which scripture contains everything you need? Would your husband concur? Yes. So if you just learn Bhagavad Gita, you're good to go. Learn Bhagavad Gita as well as you know your cell phone number. 18 chapters, 700 verses, and there are even four essential nutshell verses. Just learn those. Okay? Everything must be performed as indicated in the Shastras. For Kali Yuga, are we in Kali Yuga? Yes. yes. For Kali Yuga, the Shastras enjoin that Sankirtan Yagya be performed always. Are we doing Sankirtan Yagya now? Yes. Kirtaniya Sada Hari. All the ritualistic ceremonies recommended in the Shastras must be preceded and followed by Sankirtan. This is the recommendation of Jiva Goswami. And we see that Prabhupada also did that. Before Arti, Kirtan. During Arti, Kirtan. After Arti, Kirtan. Kirtan, Kirtan, Kirtan. Do you agree? Good. Next excerpt. Same section, Narada is instructing Yudhisthira. During the period for offering oblations to the demigods, oh, now this, this is Narada giving advice to you householders. So listen now, Narada is your well-wisher. This is very instructive. During the period of offering oblations to demigods, one should invite only two Brahmins. And while offering oblations to the forefathers, one may invite three Brahmanas. Or in either case, even one Brahmana will suffice. Even though one is very opulent, he should not endeavor to invite more Brahmins or make various expensive arrangements on these occasions. If one arranges to feed many Brahmins or relatives during the Shraddha ceremony, there will be discrepancies in time, place, respectability, and ingredients, the person to be worshipped, and the method of offering worship. When one gets the opportunity of a suitable auspicious time and place, one should offer with love, offer food prepared with ghee. What was that word? Ha. Ah, this is why I like Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Didn't say coconut oil. Didn't say dalda. Didn't say mazola. Ghee. G H E E. Ghee. Hey, I, this is Prabhupada. Oh, no, this is Narada. This is Narada. It's not even Pra. It's Narada. So, don't argue with Narada Muni. One should offer food prepared with ghee to the deity and then offer the prasad to a suitable person, a Vaishnava or a Brahmana. This will be the cause of everlasting prosperity. Just let that sink in. So when you offer food cooked in ghee to the deity, and then you invite a suitable person, a Vaishnava or a Brahman, this is the cause of everlasting prosperity. Who wants everlasting prosperity? There you go. Offer food cooked in. Offer it to... And then it invites what? Vaishnava or Brahman. Very good. Will you accept such an invitation? Very good. All right. He's a Vaishnava and a Brahman. He'll take 
you know, if you want to make, he'll, you have your book ready? This will be the cause of everlasting prosperity. One should offer prasad to the demigods, the saintly persons, one's forefathers, the people in general, one's family members, one's relatives, and one's friends, seeing them all as devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Notice, Narada says we are to see the demigods as devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is how Lord Chaitanya also, Lord Chaitanya also visited the temple when he was traveling. He would sometimes visit temples of Lord Shiva and he would offer obeisances by falling down. But he was ob observing them as devotees, not as God. He was offering respects to them, just like it says here by Narada, as devotees. But still he was bowing down. Okay. A person fully aware of religious principles should never offer anything like meat, eggs, or fish in the Shraddha ceremony. And even if one is a Kshatriya, he himself should not eat such things. When suitable food prepared with... What's the word? Now I want to hear everybody say, thank you very much, is offered to saintly persons. The function is pleasing to the forefathers and the Supreme Lord who are never pleased when animals are killed in the name of sacrifice. Now this next instruction by Narada is so important. Please listen. Persons who want to advance in superior religion in other words, there's inferior religion and there's superior religion. So those who want to advance in superior religion are advised to give up all envy of other living entities, whether in relationship to the body, words, or mind. There is no religion superior to this. This comes from Narada Muni. He's one of the 12 Mahajans. So when you can give up envy, you are on the topmost platform of religion. That's why we chant, Vancha kalpatarubhyascha, kripa sindhubhyayevacha, patitanang bhavanebhyo, vaishnavebhyo namo namaha. Prabhupada now comments, on what Narada Muni just spoke to Yudhisthira. One should not make very elaborate arrangements to perform the Shraddha ceremony of offering oblations to one's forefathers. The best process for the Shraddha ceremony is to distribute Bhagavat Prasad, remnants of food that has first been offered to Krishna to all of one's forefathers and relatives. This makes a first-class Shraddha ceremony. In the Shraddha ceremony, there is no need to offer meat or eat meat. Unnecessary killing of animals must be avoided. Those who are in the lower grades of society prefer to perform sacrifices by killing animals. But one who is advanced in knowledge must avoid such unnecessary violence. Narada Muni has prohibited unnecessarily gorgeous arrangements to feed relatives or Brahmins during the Shraddha ceremony. Those who are materially opulent spend lavishly during this ceremony. Indians spend especially lavishly on three occasions. At the birth of a child, at marriage, and while observing the Shraddha ceremony. But the Shastras prohibit the excessive expenditures involved in inviting many Brahmins and relatives, especially during the Shraddha ceremony. Now the next excerpt 
is from one of Prabhupada's purports. Fire is certainly devoid of life, but devotees and Brahmins are the living representatives of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, to feed Brahmins and Vaishnavas is to feed the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly. It may be in concluded that instead of offering fire sacrifices, one should offer foodstuffs to Brahmins and Vaishnavas, for that process is more effective than fire yagya. The vivid example of this in action was given by Sri Advaita Prabhu when he performed the Shraddha ceremony for his father. Advaita Prabhu first of all called Haridas Thakur and offered him food. It is the practice that after finishing the Shraddha ceremony, one should offer food to an elevated Brahmin. But Advaita Prabhu offered food first to Haridas Thakur, who had taken birth in a Mohammedan family. Therefore, Haridas asked Advaita why he was doing something which might jeopardize his position in Brahmin society. Adwaita, because at that time, 500 years ago, the, in Bengal, the caste system was very rigid. So what Advaita did here was very revolutionary. Advaita Prabhu replied that he was feeding millions of first-class Brahmins by offering the food to Haridas Thakur. Advaita Prabhu was prepared to talk with any learned Brahmin on this point and prove definitely that by offering food to a pure devotee like Haridas Thakur, he was equally as blessed as he would have been by offering food to thousands of learned Brahmins. Because Haridas Thakur was a pure, pure Vaishnava. When performing sacrifices, one offers oblations to the sacrificial fire. But when such oblations are offered to Vaishnavas, they are certainly more effective. Now, this next excerpt occurs at the end of the Vaman Kata. The Vamana Dev Kata is several chapters, I think nine chapters in the eighth canto. And at the end, Shukadeva Goswami says the following. Shukadeva says, Whenever the activities of Vamana Dev are described in the course of a ritualistic ceremony, whether the ceremony be performed to please demigods, to please one's forefathers in Pitriloka, or to celebrate a social event like a marriage, that ceremony should be understood to be extremely auspicious. Last week, we did a very special program at my good friend, my right-hand man, Krishna Kumar of Kundan Loka. And I insisted, since last Saturday was the actual day of Vamana Dwadasi, so I insisted we must hear the story of Vamana Dev. And at the end, I was ecstatic. Because it's based on this. That is understood to be extremely auspicious. And we dedicated that to Kundan's brother, who just passed away, and to your niece. So let's chant Hare Krishna for both of them right now. Everybody, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jai. Prabhupada comments, There are three kinds of ceremonies, specifically ceremonies to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead or demigods, those performed for social celebrations 
like marriages and birthdays, and those meant to please the forefathers like the Shraddha ceremony. In all these ceremonies, large amounts of money are spent for various activities, but here it is suggested that if along with this there is recitation of the wonderful activities of Vamanadev, certainly the ceremony will be carried out successfully and will be free of all discrepancies. Because prior to this, before Shukadev gives his conclusion, after Bali Maharaj is sent down to the low planets, after Indra and the demigods are reinstated in their positions, Vamanagave goes to Shukadachari and says, Gurudev, point out the faults of your disciple Bali. And Shukadachari says, My Lord, whenever there is a religious ceremony or a sacrifice, there are bound to be mistakes in the time, the place, the rituals, the chanting, the pujas, and you know, all those things. Do you do that? That stuff? You don't do. Some temples they do, they go. Mudras. Anyway, there's bound to be mistakes. But Shukadacharya said, But my Lord, when your name is chanted, everything becomes faultless. So let's chant to make this faultless. Everybody. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare, Hare. Hare. Rama, Hare Rama. We only have a couple more to go. We'll end on time. Here's another excerpt from a purport. After giving up the... Oh, this is interesting. Yes, we mentioned this already. I forgot. We already mentioned this. Watch. After giving up the body, one is transferred to another body. But sometimes, if one is too sinful, he or she is checked from transmigrating to another body and thus becomes a ghost. What is a ghost? Okay. Okay. You have a gross body, but you also have a subtle material body. Mind, intelligence, ego, contaminated consciousness. That's what's covering the soul. So when you die, that subtle body goes with the soul to the next body. So, as it says here, if you are very sinful, you don't get another car. The body is like a car. No car for you. But you still have that mind, intelligence, ego. And what does that mean? You still have desires, but no keys. You can't execute because in order to fulfill desires, you need a car, you need a body. It's like sometimes parents tell their children, you're grounded. Can't go out, can't do anything. Same way, that's what a ghost is. Grounded. Okay, so. To save a person from ghostly life, the funeral ceremony or sraddha ceremony as prescribed in authorized shastra must be performed. In other words, if one of your forefathers is a ghost the Shraddha ceremony will deliver them now this is what he meant look at what Prabhupada says Ravana was killed by Lord Ramachandra and was destined for hellish life but by Lord Ramachandra's advice the Bishan Ravana's brother performed all the duties prescribed in relation to the dead Thus, Lord Ramachandra was kind to Ravan even after Ravan's death. Is Lord Ram the greatest? Yes. So, that is so nice. And you can see what happened. In his next life, he was Shishupal. And the Shastra said, Shishupal had immense opulence. 
He had great opulence. It's all because of what Babishan did. Okay? But he had one problem. He was envious of Krishna. And we just read, if you give up envy, that's the superior religion. It's all because of envy. If we have any problems in our family, community, temple, the root cause, envy. There I've said it. Whether it be any place, envy is the cause. Give up envy. We don't have any envy here tonight, do we? I don't envy you. Why should I? You're my family. And you all love me, right? Thank you. So everything's nice. But as soon as envy comes in, that's when there's going to be a problem. This next excerpt is from Bhagavad Gita. Sankara narakayaiva kulagnanam kulasyacha patanti pitra hyeshang lipta pundo dakakriya. Arjuna said, An increase of unwanted population certainly causes hellish life both for the family and for those who destroy the family tradition. The ancestors of such corrupt families fall down because the performances for offering them food and water are entirely stopped. Purport. According to the rules and regulations of fruitive activities, there is a need to offer periodical food and water to the forefathers of the family. This offering is performed by worship of Vishnu because eating the remnants of food offered to Vishnu can deliver one from all kinds of sinful actions. So what kind of food? Food offered to Vishnu. Sometimes forefathers may be suffering from various types of sinful reactions. And sometimes some of them cannot even acquire a gross material body and are forced to remain in subtle bodies as ghosts. Thus, when the remnants of prasadam food are offered to forefathers by descendants, the forefathers are released from ghostly or other kinds of miserable life. Such help rendered to forefathers is a family tradition, and those who are not in devotional life are required to perform such rituals. Now, this, is the, this, this next thing by Prabhupada, the best. This is the final instruction. Listen very carefully. We've heard all day, all night about when to do it, how to do it, how not to do it. This last thing, pay attention. One who is engaged in devotional life is not required to perform such actions. So you have to be fully engaged as a devotee. That's what he's referring to. When you are fully engaged as a devotee. Simply by performing devotional service. So how many kinds of devotional service? Nine. Which one are you doing now? Which one am I doing? I'm doing two. Hearing and chanting. What are we going to do in two minutes? Archinam. So there are nine processes. So, simply by performing devotional service, one can deliver hundreds and thousands of forefathers from all kinds of misery. Is Prabhupada great or what? Just by doing devotional service. It is stated in the Bhagavatam 
Devarshi Bhutaptan Mirang Petrinam Naking Koronayam Rene Charajan Sarvatmana Ya Sharanang Sharanyang Gato Mukundang Parhiritya Karatam Anyone who has taken shelter of the lotus feet of Mukunda, everybody say. Mukunda means one who gives liberation. Everybody say that name. So anyone who has taken shelter of Mukunda, the giver of liberation, giving up all kinds of ob obligation, and has taken to the path in all seriousness, owes neither duties nor obligations to the demigods, the sages, general living entities, family members, humanity, or forefathers. But you have to be fully engaged, seriously engaged. That's what protects you. Fuck myself. I've never done the Shraddha ceremony for my father because I understand this. I simply have to do devotional service day in and day out. Then I will deliver not just my father, but my father's 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 father. 21 generations back and forward. Simply by doing Hearing, chanting, remembering, praying, worshipping, becoming Krishna's friend, and ultimately surrendering. So my real duty is to become completely surrendered to Krishna. That takes care of everything. Such obligations are automatically fulfilled by performance of the nine items of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's the best I can go, Kakani Ji.